All right, we will now move a little further into chapter two and introduce the second section, I'm sorry, chapter four, introducing the second section of chapter four, 4.2. Chapter four is sort of a, a little bit of a deviation from the statistical work we've been doing because now we're talking about probability. And in our last little looky look, we looked at the basic concepts of probability. And now we're going to move into the addition rule and multiplication rule, meaning we're going to look at manipulations that you do in calculations using logic as a justification um, when doing probability calculations. And so when we have addition and multiplication, you can already hear that sounds like sort of more of a mathematical manipulation of something. And um, rules, of course, means how you can do things. And so this is going to be a little bit more symbolic, a little bit um, harder to connect what they're talking about to concepts. And so I'm going to spend some extra time in our discussion today trying to motivate us to think about individual examples. In fact, I think uh, just having looked through the slides, they're a little bit light on the examples that they should be doing and they're focusing more on the notation, which means if we're not careful, it's very easy for students almost immediately to just lose track of what they're talking about or understand what they're asking you to learn how to do. And so um, I'm saying that because again, I'm encouraging those of you who are in class and engaged to try to provide examples, to ask questions. And I think today's session um, that could be particularly helpful to try to help us uh, penetrate the difficult way that the slides and the book are going to present today's topics. So having said that, let's look at the key concept for 4.2. In this section, we present the addition rule. And again, they haven't said what that is because it's in bold as a tool for finding P, A, or B. So what does that mean from our first section notation? A and B would be events like flipping a coin and getting heads or having a child and having a girl. Some of the things we've seen as examples, those are events. P stands for probability. So that notation means the prob probability of A or B, meaning one event or the other occurring. And it starts to tries to sort of sum that up here, which is the probability that either event A occurs or event B occurs, or that they both occur, one or the other being sufficient and both of them being okay as well. Um, as a single outcome of a procedure. So for example, I could say um, that we had three kids and one event was that the first child was a boy. And the other event is that all three child, all three children were boys. So it could happen that the first child was a boy. It could happen that all three were boys. Um, and you could say one or the other. Um, and there's, we'll look at other examples as well. Um, and in fact, in those two cases, if all three are boys, then the first one had to be a boy, so then they both must have occurred. But uh, anyway, so this is an example of this addition rule, and we're going to look at it. And it does point out the word or in the addition rule is associated with the addition of probabilities. And so we're going to talk about the difference between the word or and the word and in these discussions, because that's going to be kind of fundamental. So the and one is next. Our key concept has two pages, one for or and now for and. This section also presents the basic multiplication rule. So they were sort of saying the or is for addition and the and is for multiplication. And hopefully that will become more clear as we work with it. Used for finding the probability that the event A and the event B both occur. The probability that A occurs and B occurs, the word and in the multiplication rule is associated with the multiplication prop probabilities of probabilities, which we will see coming up. So uh, let me begin by just focusing on the difference between these two words and then they'll throw some symbols at us. 
So we want to use the idea of and or or for A and B on being events. You want to kind of think of that as an event occurring is kind of like a condition, especially when you're talking about probabilities. So I'll give a simple example. Um, if I have numbers from one to 100, then if I imagine if one of those is randomly chosen, what is the probability that I choose a number between one and 10? As we discussed in the first section, the classical way to think about this is by making a fraction. There are 10 ways to get a number from one to 10. And there's a hundred ways to pick any number at all. They're all equally likely because it's just randomly chosen. And so the probability of getting a number from one to 10 would be 10 divided by hundred, the number of ways to have the event occur divided by the number of ways anything can occur, which simplifies to one tenth because one tenth of the numbers are between one and 10. There's a one tenth probability one of those would be randomly chosen. So now let's say that is event A. Event A is that I chose a number between one and 10. The probability of event A is one tenth. So now let's say another event B is that I happen to choose of those hundred numbers an even number. Well, again, what's the probability of choosing an even number when choosing numbers from one to 100? Well, 50 of them, half of them are even, and the other 50 are odd. So the number of ways I can pick an even number is 50. There's 100 altogether. So 50 out of 100 is the probability of choosing an even. And as you can see, 50 over 100 reduces to one half or 50%. There's a 50% chance of picking an even number because half are even, half are odd. All right, so there's my two events. A is the number from one to 10, and B is that I picked an even number. So now let's use these words and and or. I'm gonna start with the second one here, and. What is the probability when I pick a number that the number is between one and 10 and the number is even? For both of those events to occur, I look at the number of ways that I could have gotten a number between one and 10, which is also even, and there's only five of those. So the probability of getting a number between one and 10 and a number that's even would be five out of 100, or 5 hundredths, which is 5%, or reduces to 1 20th. So there's a 5% chance that I would pick a number that is even and between one and 10. Now, if we go back to the or, well, what's the probability that I pick a number that's even or between one and 10? Well, some of them are both, but when you use the word or in that context, the event is satisfied, has occurred, as long as either one of those conditions have been met. And so I would count up all the numbers that are between one and 10 or even. Now, if I think of those separately, there's 10 numbers between one and 10, there's 50 numbers from one to 100 that are even, but I can't just total those up and say there's 60 numbers that are one or the other, because some of the numbers from one to 10 were counted twice. There are even numbers from one to 10, and they're in the even group, they're also in the one to 10 group. So what I'd really have to do is say, well, there's 10 numbers from one to 10, and then above 10, 11 to 100, there's 90 numbers. Half of those are even, that's only 45. So there are 45 even numbers above one to 10, and then the 10 numbers from one to 10. So there's a total of 55 numbers that are either even or between one and 10, and of course, or both. And so the likelihood of getting a number that is between one and 10 or even is 55 out of 100 or 55%. Anyway, I'm trying to use an example that's detailed enough to discuss the different possibilities, but simple enough so that we can imagine it and think of it quickly to try to ground all of the notation that they're about to give you. So let's continue by saying, are there any questions, comments, or discussions about the idea or the example 
of probabilities of an one event and the other or the other in my 100 number example. Questions, comments, or discussion? So let me give you one bottom line to start to take away from this and think about from the very beginning, and then we'll start to dive into the ugly notation. It's harder for A and B to occur than for A or B to occur. Because for A or B to occur, that's not very exclusive. You have a couple of different ways that you can have a successful result. But for A and B, they both have to have happened. One by itself would not be sufficient. There are more people that are tall or have blue eyes than there are people that are tall and have blue eyes. The and is more exclusive and more restrictive. All right, let's see with these ideas in mind and this discussion in front of us, if we can start to make sense of the litany of symbology you're about to encounter. All right, so first new definition, compound event. We've been talking about events from the first section, event A, event B, things like that. Something happens. A compound event is any event combining two or more simple events. Again, simpler events are events, simple events are events that can't be broken down into simpler components. But a compound event, therefore, is not a simple event because it can be broken into a combination of two simple events. So uh, an example, um, uh, a, a compound event um, could be, um, well, let's start with the two simple events. Let's say we go back to our having children example and you have three kids. So one simple event is that you had a boy and then you had a girl and then a girl. That was one of the simple events. There were eight of them listed in our previous example, a boy and then a girl and then a girl. And then another compound event, I'm sorry, another simple event could be that you had a boy and then another boy and then a girl. So in the first event, you had boy, girl, girl. And then the second event, you had boy, boy, girl. And so a compound event um, would be that the last child you had was a girl. And so that would be those two simple events that we just talked about. Um, but actually, it would include one more simple event where you just had all girls. So saying the last child was a girl, you could have girl, 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 boy, girl, girl, or boy, boy, girl. And so that as a compound event, the last child being a girl, having had three children, would be a combination of the three different ways that that could have occurred. So that would be a compound event. So now they give us that first addition rule and they give us the notation P, A, or B equals the probability in a single trial, event A occurs or event B occurs or they both occur. So the second part is an English statement describing the logical ways that A or B can happen, but the notation on the left is what will be used to mean what is stated on the right. And we've already looked at examples of this. So if they write P, if A is the event that I drew a number from one to 100 that was 10 or less, and B is the event that I drew a number from one to 100 and it was even, then probability of A or B is that I, in a single drawing of a number, that I got a number that was from one to 10, or that I got an even number, or the number was both. Using the statement on the right to fill that out. So the intuitive sense for the addition rule to find the probability that one or the other occurs of two events, add the number of ways event A can occur and the number of ways B can occur, but add in such a way that every outcome is counted only once. 
P of A or B is equal to that sum divided by the total number of outcomes in the sample space. So if they describing this without giving any example, this is just hard to follow along with. But if we think about the example that I was previously discussing, hopefully we can make sense of what they're saying here. To find the probability that I get a number from one to 10 or even, add the ways I can get a number from one to 10, which is 10, and the number of ways I can get an even number, which is 50, but add them in a way that I don't count something twice. I only count things once. So what I pointed out was that the even numbers from one to 10 is in the group of evens that's 50 and in the group of 10, and we don't wanna count those twice. So if I count those first 10, then when I look at the even numbers that aren't in the first 10, I throw away the first five from the 50 going down to 45. That's making sure that I'm only, each outcome is only counted once. And then I ended up with 55 numbers out of 100 that are either from one to 10 or even or both. And so that's the example I use to try to have us think about this in advance so that when we see what they're saying here, we can try to make sense of it. Questions, comments, discussions about that? So there's a formal rule for how you can do this sort of like with a little equation. The probability of A or B, <coughs> excuse me, is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Where the probability of A and B denotes the probability that A and B both occur at the same time as an outcome in a trial of a procedure. Now notice they haven't talked about the probability of A and B yet formulaically. They did the or first, not the and first, but they're using it here in this formula. So what would this look like in the example I gave? The probability of getting a number less than 10 or even is the probability of getting a number less than 10, which is 10 out of 100, plus the probability of getting an even, which is 50 out of 100. That gets us to 60 out of 100. As we described before, that's too much. You counted those five small even numbers twice. But the way you fix that is you subtract the probability of getting a number that's from one to 10 and even, recognizing that those two numbers would have been counted in both the P of A and the P of B, and therefore were counted twice. You subtract that set of probabilities, the probability that it's even and 10, that would be five out of 100 to adjust for that. So what we'd end up with in this case for our example is that you'd have 10 out of 100 plus 50 out of 100, giving you 60 out of 100, minus five out of 100, reducing it back to the correct number of 55 out of 100, and therefore helping to calculate the correct probability. Questions, comments, discussions about this rule? Okay, so now we're gonna give a new definition which will help us recognize when you have two events, how probabilities about some combination of those events should be calculated. And this is the concept of whether the events are disjoint or mutually exclusive. Events A and B are disjoint, mutually exclusive, if they cannot occur at the same time. That is disjoint events do not overlap Sometimes you, and I think you'll see this more in the book, there's these things you can use to try to imagine this called Venn diagrams, those two little circles that kind of overlap in the middle, it looks like a MasterCard symbol or something. Um, we don't really think those are brought up much in the slides. So for example, if my events are, as I just described, getting a number from one to a hundred and getting an even number, we could say, are those events disjoint? Are they mutually exclusive? And if they can both occur at the same time, they are not disjoint. And since it is possible to get a number that is less than 10 and also even, then those events are not disjoint. So to give an example of events that are disjoint, 
I could say I'm flipping a coin and one possible event is that I get heads. And another possible event is that I get tails. Well, we can pretty clearly see that one or the other of those can occur, but not both. And since they can't both happen, those are examples of disjoint events. All right, so let's try to engage your imagination. If you're still listening in. See if you can imagine some sort of a procedure or some sort of result in which we classify an event, a particular kind of outcome, and another event, another kind of outcome, A and B, however you want to think of it. And try to think of two events which would be disjoint, where both, not both things could occur from that procedure. And if you're willing to share it, please do. Uh, I don't know if this is the best example, but one I thought of is like the percent of DBC students that will register for a certain class will be the first one. And the second one will be like the percent of DBC students that will get, say, an A in that class. Like that depends on them registering for the class. Okay. So, um, the event, so, so let's try to focus on the idea of what the outcome would be. So you said a percent of students register for a class. Sounds like you're referring to a percentage, like a number. Um, so let's say uh, your event is that you are choosing a student from the group of all students at DVC. And the event would be that you chose a student who was registered for a particular class. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. So you'd have, imagine it that you have a big group of students and when you pick a student, you could say was the result that the student I picked somebody who is in this class. So then for the other event, also a procedure is you picked a student. The other event is you that the student you picked got, uh, what did you say? Like a certain, like an A in the class or something? Yeah, something like that. So then the other event would be, I picked a student and I saw that they have an A for that class. All right, so are those disjoint events? Are those mutually exclusive? Could they both occur? Could you pick a student who was registered for the class and pick up, and that student got an A in that class. Oh, actually, I mean, I don't know what I was thinking, but I think when I was thinking of the example, I, I sort of had the opposite in my mind, like, like, uh, oh, they do have to rely on each other, but. That's good. Uh, You're thinking yeah. of a concept which we will come up and maybe you've heard of before called dependent. Like whether one event is dependent on the other in some way. So, but let's, but let's still use your good example of two events to see if we could talk about disjoint or mutually exclusive. Are you able to form an opinion on whether the events that we thought of are disjoint or not? Um, well, I think, I mean, I guess the one I thought of would be dependent, but. Um, well, that, that, that's okay, it's a separate, definition, but let's use this definition to the same two events that you thought of. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. So yeah. Anytime um, you have two events, you can ask whether they're disjoint or not, whether you are thinking of them for some other reason or not. This is just a definition that can be applied to any two events resulting from the same procedure. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Or do you, are you unable to form an opinion about it? And I can explain it if that's the case. Do you mean form an opinion on whether the example I gave are disjoint? Correct. Whether the two events, one event being I chose a student at random and they were registered for this class and I chose a student at random and they got an A in that class. Well, I'd say they're not disjoint because as I think you maybe said that you can register in a class and, and also of course end up with an A in the class. So exactly. I'm gonna say they're not disjoint. Perfect. Yeah, exactly right. So definitely it's possible that I pick a student and both events have occurred. They were registered for the class and they got an A in the class. Absolutely. 
Anybody else want to try to provide an example of two events and then we can structure them to think about them as events in the language of our probability chapter and then try to classify them as being disjoint or not disjoint. Tough stuff. Well, hopefully you're racking your brains about it, even if you're unwilling to share. Let me give you one more example and then we'll move on. So let's say I'm going to buy a car and I go to some used car lot and I'm looking at over the cars and I'm thinking, all right, well, I know that um, I would like to get a red car. And uh, my wife being prudent uh, told me not to spend more than $15,000 on a used car. So let's say I get a car. One event is that I um, got a car for less than $15,000. And another event is that I got a red car. Are those disjoint? Okay, so uh, a red car and a car under $15,000, um, it may be in a particular parking lot or a particular used car lot, I can't find a car that's both, but certainly uh, just in and of itself, there's no reason to think that both of those events could not occur where I get a red car that's under $15,000. And so those are not disjoint or mutually exclusive. The simplest example of things that are disjoint or mutually exclusive is that something occurs or that it does not occur. You could have one event being that something happened like I got heads and the other event being something happened like I did not get heads. Those are called um, complement events and we'll be talking about those more uh, coming up, but that's a simple way to get disjoint or mutually exclusive events because typically we don't think something both could happen and have not happened at the same time. All right, so moving forward. Event A, randomly selecting someone for a clinical trial who is a male. Event B, randomly selecting someone for a clinical trial who is female. The selected person cannot be both. So this is an example of disjoint events, kind of like heads or tails, male or female. Maybe that's arguable in modern day and age of uh, gender confusion. But uh, that's why I think they're specifying that we're not going to allow that they can be say, say that they would both be both, maybe genetically, perhaps. Events that are not disjoint, randomly selected someone taking a statistics course, randomly selecting someone who is female. Summary of key points for the addition rule to find the probability that A or B occurs. First, associate the word or with addition, thinking it's A happens, all the ways A can happen, and all the ways are added to all the ways that B can happen. The reason is that and is often thought of as addition, like if I take his money and money, then I add them. But in this case, they're trying to help you associate the word or with addition, because we want to think of the number of ways A could have occurred or the number of ways B could have occurred, then we have to total those up. Of course, uh, as it says, to find the value, we have to make sure we out, we're not double counting. As in my example, even numbers less than 10 was the things that had to be not double counted. So there's their summary. So now, as I was just mentioning, they're gonna introduce the concept of complementary events and the, how that affects the addition rule that we were just looking at. We use the event A symbol with a line drawn across the top, which is usually read A bar, because there's like a bar across the top, to indicate that event A does not occur. So you can see the bar on the top and read A bar or A complement um, or not A, basically. Common sense dictates this principle. We are certain with probability one, that's certainty, that either an event A occurs or it does not occur. So that it follows that the probability that A happens or A does not happen is equal to one. Because one or the other of those things is certain to have occurred. Because events A and B must be disjoint, we can use the addition rule to express this principle as follows. 
that the probability of A or not A, which is those two things separately, adds up to one. So this rule of complementary events can be used to the fact that if you knew the probability of either one of those, then you could subtract that from one and the rest would be the probability for the other. Since they add up to one, the probability of not A is one minus the probability of A. And similarly, the probability of A is one minus the probability of not A. So we can think about this logically but pretty quickly they'll use examples in which a lot of times one way or the other of these is much easier to calculate. Let's see if they give us an example. There we go. Based on a journal article, the probability of randomly selecting someone who has sleepwalked is a little less than 30%. So the probability of sleepwalk equals 0 0.292 based on data from some study. If a person is randomly selected, find the prob probability of getting someone who has not sleepwalked. So since the probability of getting someone who has sleepwalked is about 30%, then the probability of someone who has not being chosen is the other 70%. You would subtract the one they gave you from one to get the probability they're asking for, which they'll do on the second slide. So if you know the probability that something has happened or that it has not happened, you can subtract either of those from one to get the other. Now we finally move on to the multiplication rule. The probability of A and B is equal to the probability that A occurs in a first trial and event B occurs in a second trial. So in this case, they're saying first trial and second trial as if you repeated a procedure. And the idea behind that is that you don't have like one flipping of the coin and one thing happening prevents the other thing from happening because it's a different result like heads or tails. I could, for example, to have these first and second trials be discussed, imagine that I flip a coin twice and probability A, or A is the event that I got heads on the first flip, and B is that I got tails on the second flip. And so the probability that I, A and B occur would be that I got heads on the first toss and I got tails on the second toss. And those both can happen because those are two separate trials. And so they're using this notation. And then they give this additional notation. As I said, you're gonna drown in notation in these slides and we have to try to keep examples in mind as best as possible. So they have probability B and then they have a big up and down bar, looks like one piece of an absolute value bar or something. And then A represents the probability of event A occurring after, I'm sorry, the probability of event B occurring after it is assumed that event A has already occurred. So in the example I was just using for A and B, A flopping heads on the first coin toss and tails in the second, probability of sort of B slash A, and it's usually read as the probability of B given A, because you're assuming that A has already occurred. I would state that as the probability that I get heads on the second toss, given that I already, sorry, that I got tails on the second toss, given that I already got heads on the first toss. That's just how to read that notation. What those probabilities are, we can discuss, but that's what it means. So the first notational um, reading would be P of A and B is the probability I got heads on the first toss and in addition also got tails on the second toss. Whereas the second one is what is the probability that I got heads tails on the second toss, given that I already know I got heads on the first toss. Okay, just to try to turn the notation into language and we will have examples for calculating these kinds of things. 
So here's the intuition they're just suggesting. The, to find the probability that event A occurs in one trial and event B occurs in another trial, multiply the probability of event A by the probability of event B. But be sure that the probability of event A and B is found, uh, probability of B is found by assuming that A has already occurred. So completely overwhelming unless you have examples to think about. And we really have to see this in action. Hopefully after we've looked at some examples, you could come back to this and make some sense of it. But as it is now, it's hard to imagine what they're talking about. So I don't know what happened to this slide. I'm not even gonna try to fix it here really. <laughs> but I think that's a multiplication symbol. I guess I can try to fix it for us. It's just pretty ridiculous. So sometimes, as I said, these slides were not, I don't know, proof checked or something. So let's uh, cross this out. So using what they just discussed, the probability of A and B is the probability that A occurred multiplied by the probability that B occurred, given that we already know that A has occurred, which is that notation on the previous slide. So I guess they just, for some reason, carried the second parentheses to the second line and put in this weird question box instead of multiplication. I don't know why. All right, but we need to see this in action. Please give us an example. No, they did not give us an example. All right, let me just give us an example and then we'll go on to another definition which they have next. And we have about 17 minutes left. Okay, so um, in the example that I was just discussing, the probability of heads on coin toss one. Well, what's the chance when I flip a coin the first time that I get heads? Well, this is going to be one out of two, one half, 50%, one half. The probability that I get tails this would be A, this would be B. Tails on toss two. Well, that's also one half. Why? Because toss two is a different toss than toss one. And it really doesn't matter what happened on the first toss. If I just say, what's the chance I got um, tails on toss two, it'll be a one half poss possibility. And just to further uh, remind us of work that we've done up till this point, here's what my sample space would look like. Again, that's a discussion from the first section, sample space. If I toss the coin twice, then one possibility is heads and heads. Um, another possibility, actually, I think I will. Yeah, I'll just do it like this notation. Or instead I get heads and tails and perhaps I get tails, then heads, or perhaps I get tails, then tails. So there's four possibly equally likely results in a simple events for a sample space for tossing two coins. And what you can see is that the probability of heads on, to, uh, on toss one, if this is A, then those are the ways that I can get A and that's two out of four or one half. And if I look at B, then that's tails on toss two, that's this one and this one, which is also two out of four. So that's also a probability of one half that I get tails on the second toss. Now, the last thing is, could I calculate this one? Let's use another color, maybe purple. What would be the probability of getting tails on toss two, given that I already got tail uh, heads on toss one? So if I already know I got heads on the first toss, that means I'm being restricted, that I'm being restricted to the top two. 
because only the top two have heads on the first toss. So if I know that already happened, then I know that one of those top two events occurred. And so then knowing that, what is the probability that I then got tails on the second toss? Well, of those two, that happened for one of them. So in this case, that would be one out of two. And as I said before, the probability of tails on toss two is one half, whether you got heads on the first toss or not, it doesn't, doesn't change the probability. But if you tried to calculate that sort of counting directly, you can still see that in this example. Now, for those of you who, maybe most of you or all of you who have not been reading into chapter four yet or thought about 4.1, I think you are long gone and completely lost at this point, and that's very understandable. So it might be you wanna come back to this video after you've had a chance to work on 4.1 for a while. I'm just pointing that out because me rambling on about stuff after you've completely lost the track of what we're talking about is a sign that the earlier work that led to this is not understood yet well, and that this could make more sense to you when it is. And hopefully at that time, you could come back and get more out of this if you're willing at that point to check out the video for, the, for today's discussion. So having said that, does anybody want to ask any questions or make comments or have some discussions about my uh, slide of stuff here? All right, Sunk, sinking deep. Let's keep, keep, keep sinking in. All right, so now next definition. Independence and the multiplication rule. Two events A and B are independent. I think it was maybe Zach earlier who was offering up an example and started getting at this idea. A and B are independent if the occurrence of one does not affect the probability of the occurrence of the other. Several events are independent if the occurrence of any does not affect the probability of the occurrence of the others. If A and B are not independent, then they are said to be dependent. All right, so we can use the example that I was just giving. So tails on the second toss is B, heads on the first toss is A. Those are two different results. A coin is tossed twice. We can ask, are they dependent or independent? Well, since the result on the first toss has absolutely no effect on the probabilities of what might happen on the second toss, these events are independent. What, whether I get heads or tails on the first toss has no effect on the probability or likelihood of getting one or the other on the second toss. So those are independent. Now, it could be if I'm trying to get a car out of a parking lot that's red and is under $15,000, that it could be that those are both possible, but that they're not independent. It might be that of all the cars on the lot under $15,000, only one of them is red because red cars are fancier and cost more. So that if I'm going to, if I know that I'm picking a car that's under $15,000, then there's a much lower probability that I'm gonna end up with a red one. Then if I just picked a car in general, there might be a much higher probability of getting a red one. Those would be potentially dependent events. All right, let's see if they give an example. Six slides for screening drugs and basic multiplication rule. Okay, that's more than we can cover in the last 10 minutes. It would be overwhelming. I'm gonna leave the, the last looks like 17 or so slides for you guys to check out on your own. We've already given multiple examples of all of these because I do wanna take the last few minutes and just take a look at an example of how the homework might be asking you to use these concepts and these calculative manipulations for probability questions. So let's stop this share and switch over to the other computer share. And I'm gonna jump into homework. And so I'm in 4.2. Uh, again, this is homework on 4.1 through 4.3. And I think I saw probably made sense around 30. Yeah. All right, so let's take a look at this as an example. 
Use the data in the following table, which lists drive through order accuracy at popular fast food chains. Assume that orders are randomly selected from those indicated in the table. And what they're showing is that at these four different restaurants, there was whether the order, how many orders were accurate and how many orders were not accurate for each one of those restaurants. If one order is selected, find the probability of getting an order from restaurant B or C, or an order that is not accurate. So what we'd wanna to do to calculate the probability of getting B or C is figure out how many ways that could happen. And then an order that is not accurate, how many ways that could happen. And as we add all of those up, we wanna make sure we're not counting anything twice. How many ways could I pick from A or C? Well, here's all of the A participant, restaurant participants. Uh, it's supposed to be B or C. <laughs> Let's pick the right ones. Okay, so here's the Bs. And here's the Cs. So I would wanna add all of those up because those are all the ways that I could pick somebody from B or C, but or an order that is not accurate. Well, some of those ones that I'm counting in the Bs or the Cs are not accurate, the ones in the bottom here. I don't wanna count those twice, but if it's just a requirement that an order is not accurate, that means I should also include the D restaurant orders that were not accurate and the A restaurant orders that were not accurate, not accurate. So what I would do is I would add up those six numbers because those are all separate from each other and nothing would be counted twice. And then divide that by the total of all of them together. And we're supposed to round this to three decimals, right? So that's the description of the idea of how the concepts that we were just discussing would be used to do this problem. So let's say I just grab a little Windows calculator to help. So I would say, all right, I'm gonna add up the six of those and I get 32 plus 58 plus 277 plus 39 plus 239 plus 12. So that gives me 657, but I wanna divide that by all the possible ways I could pick anybody, which means I need to add a couple more numbers to get that total. So this is 657. And then adding to that, I would add the 127 and the 338. And I get 11, 1122. So that's gonna be 657 divided by 1122. And that gives me a, uh, all the number of ways that I could get B or C or a not accurate order divided by all the number of ways that I could get anybody. And this gives me this percentage, which I'm supposed to round to the um, round the, to three decimal places. So then I would go over there and say, okay, so that's five, eight, and the last five needs to be rounded to a six, five, eight, six, so 0.586. So there's an example how I used the concepts that we just discussed to do one of your homework problems. This is number 30. And we use the idea of how to calculate a probability using the addition rule, where you basically add up the different ways each of the things could happen, but in a way that you don't double count anything. 